we're back. And this little segment, uh, we want to talk about uh, the importance of the tools, uh, the cameras, uh, what it takes to, to make the image. And through Ed's career, he's moved from uh, film, analog, if we call it that these days, into uh, the digital realm. And uh, he's got a great story in regards to that. But I think one of the things that's most important to realize is that early on, the image quality was of utmost importance. And as you heard in the previous segment, he did a lot with view cameras and uh, four by five film to capture the minute detail of some of the subjects you know, that he was capturing when he was back doing his nature side of things. And that continued along the way. And you worked from four by five to eight by 10 somewhere along the way until finally uh, the where we are today uh, digitally. So I'm gonna let Ed talk a little bit about the importance of uh, image quality, how it's played the importance and uh, the transition from when you started with film to where you are with your tools today in the digital world and, and when it was that you made that decision that digital was here. Right. Well, I always had a fascination with one of the qualities of photography that, that it had that, for instance, painting didn't have. And when I was younger, I grew up painting with my father uh, with oils on the back of Masonite. Uh, and then when I was 11, I got my first 35 millimeter camera and went out shooting black and white film with it. And I shot largely black and white for the first 10 years of my life. And, uh, but as soon as I decided I wanted to get more serious about photography, I, I, I left my hometown, St. Catharines, and moved to Toronto and went to the university that I graduated from, Ryerson, and took uh, a photography program that uh, gave me a Bachelor of Arts, which was considered the best uh, at that time and still is considered one of the best in the country. And the minute I got there, uh, the first thing I did is I bought a two and a quarter. I ended up buying a, a Mamiya two and a quarter camera, 645. And I ran around with that a lot. And then um, one of my instructors introduced me to the 4x5 through an assignment. And I started shooting with a 4x5. And I loved the process of it. And I loved the quality of the images that I got. So right out of the gate, I was always interested in the print and making these incredible prints and, the, and, and what the experience of that kind of detail and resolution and tonality that a print can give you that can really make you experience uh, a, you know, a piece of our world. And what was interesting to me was to take something that may not normally be thought of uh, as uh, you know, subject matter for an image and using a high resolution tool, have it transcend into another kind of space where you're looking at a piece of our world, but yet it seems to transport you into another world, a world of wonder or, or, or of aesthetic where you're kind of trying to make sense of where this is in the world and why did the artist, you know, take a picture of that and, but yet at the same time be drawn to the image. And so as I worked through, I, I worked with, you know, four by five, but then I discovered color and started working with color, uh, I think around 1980, 80, 81. And once I turned to color from black and white, I never kind of turned back. I just kept doing so color. So just man went to color. I went to color. Uh, and at the time, I mean, there were a few color uh, artists working at the time. Stephen Shore, uh, Elliot Porter had done a series of color uh, of the landscape. And there, like, there was a handful. Uh, Joel Meyerowitz was working at the time. I thought, you know, this is pretty interesting. You know, not very many are engaged in color and art and the large format image. Uh, and I thought I could really start pioneering my own way through all of this technology and through the new materials. So I started doing and working with uh, 4x5. Eventually I progressed to uh, 4x5 and 8x10. In 1990, when I was doing the quarries, I thought, hey, it might be really interesting to take the next jump and go and I borrowed a four by uh, an eight by ten with all the lenses and started shooting eight by ten and then fell in love with that one more leap of difficulty and when you start working with eight by ten but I again appreciated that slowing down that difficulty that kind of mastering of 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 a, of a technology like that and getting it sharp per perfect exposure great light it really takes a long time sometimes I'd spend two days 
setting up and waiting for the light for one 8x10 image. It's incredible. I love it when you, when you do that. Now, were you doing negative or transparency film? All negative. All negative. Yeah. I did a whole trip where I did one holder negative and one holder transparency, and I did Cibachromes and, uh, and prints just to make sure where I wanted to go. And two things happened. One is I recognized how limiting transparency was. In other words, if you shoot within a three to four stop range, it works great. And it's pretty nice, but then you go into a Cibachrome and it was very poppy. It was just like so super saturated. And then when you did with the negative, same scenes, printed on the paper at that time, and it just seemed more to yeah, me more, more control yeah, of more control, know, more color. more natural color than than what 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 uh, transparency yeah. had. So I, I then said, okay, no, I'm going negative all the way, and I never looked back. I just did everything in negative at that point. So then when I started shooting 8x10, I already had the lab, so it allowed me to really control the 8x10 processing. I had my own processor, and I had my own printing machines, and I had my own 8x10 enlarger, so I can enlarge, you know, up to, at that time, I was doing 40x50s. In 1992, uh, I opened up a digital lab teaching Photoshop, and, you know, the digital cameras were, right. were pretty rudimentary back then, you know, 10 megapixels, 7 megapixels. I remember... Kodak had, uh, I think, a refitted Nikon and with a back on it. I think it was seven megapixels and it cost $50,000 or something. It's I went, oh, right. this is the future. <laughs> a little expensive yeah. right now. You saw the future. You, you saw, yeah, you recognized I recognized it. it. Yeah, this isn't going to get uninvented. Yeah. This, is, this has got a one-way trip. Yeah. I kept working with the tools. And when I started doing the China project in 2003, 4, and 5, I was shooting. And China is very hazy. And so I'd come back with my negatives, and they'd be like, I'd print them, and they'd be really flat. And I'm thinking, well, what can I do? So then I started scanning them, getting the color correction that I wanted, and then putting them back into a, a negative. So and you then went through a hybrid digital solution at that time. At that time, There yeah. was no printing capability, so you rewrote a new negative. Right. You rewrote a new negative, and then for, with that negative, I'd go back in the enlarger and, and blow it up. Uh, and I worked that way for a while, and then some technology started to come into play, uh, the light jet, the Durst Lambda, and the Chromira. So then, uh, just around 2005, I ended up buying the Chromira, which is a ZBE yep. a company that I can write directly onto photo paper. And so I started doing those China images directly to photo paper, that instead of going to the inter-negative uh, stage. And I did that for a while, but then I also started to try to do aerial work. And the problem with taking a 4x5 up into, number one, you, you can't let the holder go. It might go into the back rotor, and then we're all going down to our deaths. And so the, you know, the, they were always afraid, the pilots were always afraid of me with holders and all that stuff just out by the door because it's, it's very dangerous. Um, secondly, it's very cumbersome, and thirdly, these large format lenses aren't very fast, they don't work very well wide open, so I was running into all these problems, so then I decided to rent uh, a Hasselblad. I rented one um, with a 40 megapixel back and shot it side by side with, with the 4x5 and realized that the results were amazing. They were much better than my 4x5 results. So. That was the first time I went into a digital camera, even though I had a digital lab at that point for 12 years. I, I still shot film because it was better. So now you're into digital capture. You've, you've hit yeah. that point where you think it's good enough. It's good enough for aerial, although I still balanced for about three years. I did half, like yeah. stuff I did on the ground with architecture, I still did with my 4x5, 8x10, because I still did architectural city mm -hmm. stuff. And then all my aerial work I was doing with digital. And then, we, you know, Hasselblad started moving into the 50 and 60 megapixel cameras. Then I started shooting more and more with that camera, and it had the tilt shift, and I started adding more and more things to it. I'd say by 2010, I had fully transformed to digital. And uh, you were working with a Hasselblad each system like this. This, yes. is, this is what the... Well, this is the new one, the 100 megapixels. We'll, 100. Come, we'll come and talk about yeah, that yeah. in a second. It's but. 100, yeah. But, but so it started with the 40, then I ended up owning the 50, then I owned the 60, and now this is the 100 that's going on my next trip. So the jump from the 60 to the 100 I'm very excited about because it's like another 67% or something of data 
and the 60 was giving me yeah. some pretty incredible results. Yeah, we have some images back here, and uh, in another segment, uh, we're going to be looking at some of the prints and you know talking about the whole print side of things. But you finally got to a point where you were getting the resolution, and if you equated that resolution off to analog, how would you numerically um, say where you know which where where the jumps were, like the four by five and and further yeah, well, where I mean, we are today. So when I did that side-by-side -side test out of the helicopter with my 4x5 and the 40 megapixel, I'd say the 40 was actually performing as well in terms of color saturation and grain, but the 4x5 was giving me trouble in the corners of softness mm -hmm. because I had to shoot almost wide open. Whereas the wide angle lens on the Hasselblad, wide open, was still sharp corner to corner. So if overall response was actually giving me better results than my 4x5 at that time. That was why I jumped over. It was through the fact that it was doing something better than, the way, than any solution I had in the analog world. And that was my first step. And then once I got into the 60 megapixel, it felt like I, you know, it was better than the 4x5, but not quite 8x10. So I'd, I'd put it like in a 5x7. Incremental by movement. Think, yeah, like a 5x7 <laughs> yep. format. Yep. And now with this 100, I'm, I'm assuming, and I haven't worked with it enough, but I'm assuming it's going to put me into back to the old 8x10 days that the quality I'm going to get hey. is as if I was standing in front of an 8x10, uh, print from an 8x10 make. You know, having used 100 megapixel, I, I want to hear what you think when you're finished with it because it truly is not just an incremental step. I think you'll find that... Uh, you know, you'll see things that you just never thought you could see before. You're, you're in for a I'm great adventure. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. So now your typical setup, you, know, you take a Hasselblad system on the road. Uh, is it many cases or do you try to travel with X number of lenses? What, what's your shooting setup all about? Well, I have about five lenses I usually take. And then I also have uh, the uh, gyro stabilizer because I do a lot of work from so uh, aerial uh, perspectives. And so I'm pointing the camera um, you know, out, of the, out of the open door of a helicopter or out of the open window of a Cessna. So you need to stabilize the camera so you don't get as much shake in it. And that does a pretty, pretty good job uh, with doing that. It does make the whole thing quite heavy. So a couple hours up in the air uh, and you come down and your, your arms are beat. Uh, but that's all right. That's part of the process. I always look, I don't complain because I've read the kind of uh, stories of, of Carlton Watkins and the mammoth plates yeah. and thinking that this is still pretty easy. You don't, need a, you don't need a mule and a mule train to yeah, take all your stuff that's to right. the top and of and, and, <laughs> cut, and cut the road to bring it through, you know. Um, so, so this is, you know, I, don't, I don't complain about, uh, you know, those kinds of things given knowing the history of photography. But the toolkit is usually about two or, two or three bags. And so I have, and I also now start working with film crews. And so I'm bringing, um, you know, the, the, the Red Epic and, and other So you're cameras. doing a video documentary at the same time. Yeah. So I've I, seen one or two of those. They're really remarkable. I, was it the water, Watermark Project? Watermark Project. Yeah, it was pretty nice. Yeah. If I've got the whole film crew coming, there's usually a you know, crew of six or seven of us, you know, 20, 25 cases with all kinds of different tools. Have you, you found a lens that's your favorite? I mean, do you prefer wide angle? Do you like the compression that the longer lens gives you? How do you select the, the lens? Or do you try to fit the, the, the image into your favorite lens? Or do you use a lens that works for the, the, the subject? When I'm working in the helicopter um, or in the plane, I have found that the slightly wide angle lens works. I've tried, it's interesting that I even did tests where I took a normal lens in a helicopter and backed away to get the, to fill the same frame and took a picture with a normal lens or got closer with a 50. And I prefer the way the 50 yeah, the reacts. It offers a nice perspective. It, it, it for, opens it up, yeah. it opens up the landscape in a different way. Yeah. There are these a series of aerial lenses that have uh, no focus ability, so they're set at infinity. And when you're up there, you know, sometimes the last thing you want is to deal with focus because you, know, you can hit some, if it's autofocus, you don't want to use it, you can hit water and all of a sudden it's going all over the sure. place because it can't grab onto anything. Eliminating focus, because I'm always more than uh, you know, 100 feet away if I'm aerial or 200 feet away, so it, it's, it's not a problem. It, so, so, so you can almost shoot wide open too. I do shoot wide okay. open, yeah, a lot, you know, uh, and because I like to shoot 
when the light is in full sun and lots of contrasts and lots of shadows, I love the softer light, it often comes later in the day. So I'm always pushing up against ASA, shutter speed and wide open all the time. So, so to me, those are the real uh, challenges. Well, with the new Hasselblad backs and you know, the CMOS technology, how do you find you know, working with higher ISOs? Are you able to work at a higher ISO, set your shutter speed higher and uh, accomplish more? Or? Well, CMOS, I understand, is, and I haven't worked a lot with it, uh, I've been, because the uh, 60 megapixels is still CCD, right. and it didn't like going past even 100. I, I, 100 was where I'd stop. 200, you'd start seeing it. 400, you really see it a lot. Whereas CMOS, you can go into higher right. ISOs and still not you know, get as much grain in it. Come back to us on that one. I, I think you're in for yeah. a pleasant surprise. Good, good. Um, this device I always find amazing. Um, you know, if you've never used, the, this is the Kenyon, correct? Yes. Yep. Um, if you've never used a gyro, it's, you can rent these. You can go online and find them. But uh, once it starts up and cycles uh, and you put the camera on, it truly is like almost like <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like fighting a live yeah, beast. You can't describe it. and It's hard to imagine that yeah. a device can do that, but it really does add a lot of stabilization. I mean, if you can get it to where you want it, and like you said, it's a heavy device, and at the same time, it's almost fighting you, but yeah. uh, remarkable for adding that maybe one or two stops at least. If I've got everything working well, I've been down to 125th of a second, 1 125th, and getting results with it. I, I'd have to multiple shoot it because not everyone's going to get it, but I can still pull it off once in a while at that, at that shutter speed in the air. But, but what I was trying to always do is, is to, whether it's in a drone or whether it's out of a helicopter or whether it's out of a fixed wing airplane, my ambition was it's, it's as if I had the camera on a tripod and squeezing off a shot on my four by five. So, so that's, you know, so even though I'm bouncing around a helicopter and it's crazy and you're getting buffeted by winds and, you, and you've got, you know, the, the, the blade, you know, blow, you know, blow down <laughs> and all, all of that happening, that at the end of the day, it still looks like you're on a tripod and squeezing it off with a shutter cable release. Do you take multiple cameras and bodies up with you? Obviously, you're not want to change lenses uh, while you're up in the air, or do you decide on just one lens no, and I one just body? one lens. One body. One body, one yeah. lens. Simplify uh, your life. No, 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 I do. It, it, it's absolutely. Like I did one where I went up to do a mine, uh, the Bingham Valley. It was a Kennecott copper mine. And I opened the door 15 or 20 below. Uh, and, it, and, 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 you, and you have the, the wash of the blade coming down, so I don't know what, what that does to the temperature. But there's a wind chill. Yeah, there's a wind chill. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I had my gloves. I think I got uh, about uh, 10 minutes out of the blad before it just, it was just like, it was just way too cold. So it just, you know, stopped. And I would imagine that any camera at that time, oh, that because at, that, at those brutal kind of temperatures. Oh, how did uh, you fare? <laughs> well, I was cold, but um, not every frame is going to be sharp because you're up against a lot of different forces. And so uh, when I get close to what I think is my shot, then, I, then I'll, you know, slow, you know, if I can, like a helicopter, mm -hmm. I'll slow it down to the point where I can squeeze off four or five, because there's usually one that just comes in crisp and the other ones aren't as crisp. So it's not an easy thing to do at all. No, it can't be. Now, you know, most of your work is you look at all your body of work is from, you know, high angle to a very high angle straight down almost sometimes. And you've shot a lot from, as you say, airplanes and, and helicopters, but you know, today we have drones. So, you know, where's the drone fitting into your uh, aerial photography aspect of things these days? Well, I still I use them, but um, the limit to a drone is about a thousand feet of elevation. The first one was a single blade, and now I'm using the the, the multiple blades, uh, octocopters or the, or the six bladed ones, and 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 putting this on it. And the the one I'm going to, I'm going to Chile. And I think the lift on the, that I have on the one, because we're starting at about uh, 8,000 feet of elevation, and then we want to go up another 1,000 or two. So for every 1,000 feet, I think you lose a, a, a pound of lift. The drone that we have now has a, a lifting capacity of 100 pounds. So A drone with a 100-pound lifting That's pretty incredible. Yeah, so we can take yeah. this and, and deal with the atmosphere and still get it up maybe 1,500 feet and shoot down uh, with it because what we're trying to shoot 
has um, needs that kind of elevation. So we need about ten, about nine thousand five hundred. You're feet. not flying the drone. You probably have an operator flying the drone, but you must have a device which you're controlling the gimbal and the camera. Correct? Yeah, so I'm just controlling the whole gimbal, and so I can do, you know, pan, tilt, roll, uh, and it's just like having a tripod. So I compose and I and I hit the shutter as well, and I've got a video signal coming back to my to to. So I'm seeing exactly what what the camera's uh, seeing. The and I actually have a GoPro sitting on top, and I send the signal <laughs> back cool. to, to my controller. Do you go above 1,000 feet a lot, or do you have a magic altitude that you, you tend to work with well, that gives you a nice angle? With a drone, well, with a drone, it's hard to go past 1,000 feet up because you, it's hard to see it after yeah. that. It just becomes a small dot, and you get less control of it. I used to have rules of thumb, like I tried not to get too far past 1,000 feet. Because I always wanted, in the, in the viewing of the print, to actually identify, oh, that's a truck or, or, or there's a person standing over there. But if the subject matter calls for it now to go further back, I will go further back. So, so I do let the, the subject matter determine you know, where, where I should stand for or where I should and be. I guess because some of your areas are so immense, you either got to get way high up or you know, be at a far enough distance with a lens that can get you, yep. you know, all that. Yep. So anyway, Hasselblad's your tool of choice these days, and your like the 40 millimeter, 50 millimeter lens is probably somewhere in your... Yeah, the 50 is great with the aerial lens. The other thing, I think the firmware, if I'm not mistaken, some of that color management was brought over from the Imicon system uh, in terms of, uh, of, of color, and it really did mirror the, the, the results I used to get from negative. And, um, and way back when, and I test everything, and way back when, when I tried, you know, with the phase and the capture system, it felt more like chrome to me. Mm -hmm. it, it felt more commercial. Whereas this, to me, it, it worked in a kind of that negative, that softer print result. So I, as an artist, I was interested in the print. And so I was able to get, to get the kinds of uh, color and be in that color space much more easily with the Hasselblad uh, in the making of prints. Very cool. Well, this has been pretty fascinating. I mean, you know, we all love our gear, but just to see what you, what you do with it. We have uh, two more segments where you're going to come into. We're going to talk about uh, the print side of things and uh, how you store your prints and what you do because the prints are so important. And we spent a lot of time on Luminous Landscape uh, talking about getting back to the print because, you know, we're into such a kind of a swiping society. And then the, the last aspect of things, we want to take a look at uh, the tour, the fact that you control the whole process is a lot different than a lot of you know photographers are doing this day, and you know not only are you working with you know with digital printers, but you're also working with uh, you know chemical-based uh, digital imaging at the same time. So I look forward to getting into the back part of the building uh, later on and taking a look at that. So Fabulous. this has been great. Uh, uh, there's a lot of books where a lot of the things we talked about uh, during the interview. You'll find uh, links in the text part of this uh, article. Uh, so that if you want to take a look at some of the other photographers mentioned or some of the gear mentioned, you'll be able to find information about that. We'll also uh, put in links to Ed's books that are available and certain aspects of his site so you can uh, kind of go in there and take a look at some of the uh, things we've talked about as far as your history and you know, some of the projects like the Watermark Project and things like that. So Great. we'll see you guys back in a little while. And uh, thanks, Ed. This is thanks, really pretty amazing. And uh, we'll be back. Here.